to do is to stimulate the notion that governments can, can play a very, very large role in managing the economy. Yeah. Um, the monetarist school uh, historically was more of the view that, no, the really important thing was the money supply. It, uh, they didn't deny the influence of, of expenditures and, and uh, taxation, but what was really important was how you controlled the money supply. Uh, both sides have gotten a little bit, uh, you know. Would that be more Milton Friedman's side? Well, Mil yes, M Milton Friedman is the most prominent name that's associated with monetarist uh, theory. Okay. Um, but it, it's got, what the media calls monetarist theory nowadays has been is quite a bit different from that. It tends to be focused on the notion that um, you can uh, expand an economy by borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, indefinitely mm -hmm. uh, and that there are no real costs to that you know it, you're, 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 as long as there you know if the money that you're borrowing is spent on um, productive uh, processes or infrastructure that will grow the economy faster than it would otherwise grow you're making the money back for future generations but in fact of course governments don't do that <laughs> they don't spend on infrastructure or on, on productive investments they spend it to fund Current programs, you know, yeah. so so um, what you you were basically burdening your future generation, you know, the, that little guy in there, yeah. and, and and his son and his and his grandchildren yeah. will all be heavily burdened by right. the kind of indebtedness. So. Well, if you look at uh, the indebtedness, the rate of indebtedness that's being incurred both by the federal uh, and by the Ontario provincial government, it's really scary. Oh it's God. really really scary. I mean, again, yeah. a whole other topic. Long, yeah, yeah, but long that's discussion. good. This is good. I'm glad to talk about this as well. In my mini series, which is called Aviation Hijacked. I had quoted a book from an author named Drieu Godefredi from Belgium. I don't know if you're familiar with no, him. Not. So he actually writes quite extensively about environmental topics as well. And so he wrote this book in 2019 titled The Green Reich, From Global Warming to Green Tyranny. And it's an excellent book. And so that inspired me a lot. And he really correlates the so-called green climate policies with a kind of his philosophical understanding of it saying that it's not really about environmentalism but it's more of an anti-humanistic kind of degrowth mentality um, and and it's kind of cultish <laughs> and so there's a lot of interesting things there and, and a lot of policymakers are now putting these um, so-called green policies into practice but i think some of them are quite naive and maybe you would agree about that in understanding how those policies actually work in real life and and what they will do to different economies and and we can feel that right now in canada um, because we're dealing with that in the aviation industry i believe that is correlated and as well in the oil and gas industry as we've seen in canada over the last couple of years. In December 2019, you wrote an article saying that the government climate policy in Canada and elsewhere will increasingly focus on a campaign to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from aviation. Yes, in that first article, I um, described uh, the uh, process or what is underway in Europe. Um, and um, in Europe, they have uh, decided to follow a number of different approaches to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from aviation, ranging from um, what might be called moral suasion or, or, or trying to influence people by uh, uh, shaming tactics to um, some uh, measures that require reporting by industry as to what their emissions are. Mm -hmm. And then leading on from that to actually regulatory measures that limit the amount of emissions uh, that uh, airlines can um, emit during the course of a year um, and requiring the airlines to purchase offset permits uh, to pay for any emissions that they have that exceed their annual quota. Uh, and um, uh, it was clear that what was happening in Europe is um, potentially going to apply globally. 
because uh, of the influence of the of the Green Party in Europe, uh, which is very strong, hmm. and because of the um, particular circumstances of Europe. If, if you think about it, Europe um, is a very densely populated continent. Yep, uh, unlike Canada. Uh, unlike Canada, yeah. exactly. And it has a very highly developed uh, rapid uh, rail system. Mm -hmm. So to the Europeans, uh, the use of, of uh, air, aircraft to travel is really a luxury. It's a kind of a, something that doesn't need to be done. Uh, and they can easily you know, move uh, away from uh, having a significant share of their uh, international travel done by air to having it done by, by surface uh, transport without any significant economic or, or dislocation uh, effects. Um, One and, and they, argue they that would it's like a luxury, I think, if I could just kind of... Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think because uh, I've been to Europe quite a few times traveling there as well, and actually their flights cost less money sometimes than taking the train. So I don't know if it's... Oh, oh I'm, I'm not suggesting that uh, they're correct in their view that... that uh, flying is the plaything of the rich, if, if you will. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm just su suggesting that from their perspective, um, it's not a necessity. Yeah. And uh, if they're the only ones that apply these different uh, approaches to reducing emissions, they're going to place themselves at a competitive disadvantage to the other countries. Therefore, it's very much in their interest that the European emissions trading system, or something like it, be extended to, to globally. Ah, I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, globally, when you talk about that, does that include countries like Canada? Does it include the United States? Does it include China and India? Well, under the, um, the Corsia uh, scheme, which was approved uh, in 2016 uh, by the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, the uh, uh, and 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 was subsequently uh, approved by by seventy eight different countries. Um, there will be introduced over um, a number of years uh, a, a regime that will require regulations that are somewhat similar to those that are in place in Europe. Okay, all having to do with carbon offsetting or carbon reduction, carbon emission reductions. In essence, it is a regulatory scheme uh, that is intended to be implemented over a period that began in, in, in 2019 with um, the collection of data, mm -hmm. will proceed in, two, in 2021 to um, a pilot program uh, that, uh, under which uh, countries will volunteer uh, to be a, a members of the regime. Uh, and then that pilot scheme will persist until the end of 2026. In, at the beginning of 2027, um, it, rather than being a, a, a pilot regime where, con where countries can voluntarily mm -hmm. offer the participation of their airlines, it will become mandatory mm -hmm. for, for those countries that have agreed to, to participate. As it stands now, um, China and India and a number of the um, Asian countries have not agreed to participate. Oh, wow. Right. So, wow. Uh, and there remain many different controversies that are unresolved wow. as to what the design of the program will be and, uh, and how broadly it'll apply. Wow, that's really interesting. So they're just saying, no, we're opting out of this. But yet, I imagine in my mind, it's kind of like a little bit of a click where you have all of these countries that are, uh, you know, the Commonwealth countries, et cetera, Canada, um, the EU, who kind of are possibly pressuring each other to all meet the same kind of standards when it comes to emissions reductions. Would that be pretty accurate? Yes, there is a, um, what, is a remarkable uh, de degree of agreement among many of the OECD countries about um, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, although that agreement um, 
you have to be careful in terms of, of your statement of what that means, in fact. Um, the, the countries of the world have been setting um, agreements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, specific targets, yeah. since 1990. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. They've never attained any of the targets. Right. Um, and when they miss a target, their re response has been to establish a more difficult target. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So it's like a New Year's resolution. Yes. And, and <laughs> you can kind of ask yourself, well, why do they do that? And, and right. that's a very interesting story in its own right. Um, and uh, it has to do with the, the interplay that goes on between environmental organizations, which are very influential, and, and politicians. Mm -hmm. um, environmental organizations um, want to establish the point that they have the moral high ground. And so one of the ways that they establish the moral high ground is to get politicians to a promise to achieve something. So, so establishing a, a political target is a promise that your country will reduce emissions by, by X amount. Mm -hmm. um, politicians, for whom I worked for many years, um, have a very simple philosophy, and that is that there is no political downside to promising to reduce emissions, only to actually doing so. Mm -hmm. So um, when the inevitable happens and the countries are not able to meet those emissions, uh, the politicians find themselves uh, constantly under attack by the environmentalists for failing to meet their promises. Right. That's, the, that's the game that, that gets played. Right. Now, and what has actually happened since 1990 is that global emissions have increased by 50% since then. Yeah. Notwithstanding all yeah. of these these promises and Absolutely. commitments and legal and so-called legal agreements, um, looking to the future, um, the if it had not been for the effects of the coronavirus this year, mm. we would have seen a continuous growth in global greenhouse gas emissions going on for the foreseeable future. Uh, the rate of growth has been slowing down, mm -hmm. largely because the uh, OECD countries, the wealthier ones, uh, have succeeded and in slowing the growth of emissions in their economies, mainly through technological change, mm -hmm. to some extent through regulations. But the, um, the growth of emissions in the non-OECD countries, mainly the countries of, of, of Asia and Middle East and elsewhere, uh, has, has been far more uh, than o offset the emissions reductions that have occurred in the OECD. In fact, over the course of the last decade, uh, the emissions growth in the non-OECD countries has been four times the reduction in emissions in the OECD countries. Right now, mm. uh, the non-OECD countries account for two-thirds of global emissions. And that would be China and India? And... and, and and Southeast and Asia well. and Brazil and okay. uh, all the other countries that are rapidly growing. Now, right. and why, why? Well, for two important reasons. A, their populations are growing rapidly, whereas in the OECD, they're largely stable or slightly growing. Yeah. And B, their economies are growing rapidly. The net effect of that is that the middle classes in the developing countries are, are growing at a remarkable pace. And, and the middle classers are the ones that have the dis discretionary income that they can spend on aviation, for example. You know, and they can spend on, they, the, for the first time, people can afford to own cars. They can mm. afford to, to uh, have heating and air conditioning in their homes. Uh, Etc. And that's a good thing, you know. That's it's a very good thing. It's, it's a good thing, and I think but, that, yeah, I think that's. If I could just um, state that, it seems that there's a lot of this kind of guilt um, among OECD countries where they feel like they need to really control. Like, if we go into the broader picture, you know, only have one kid. You'll see these kind of campaigns mm. now as well, kind of like a degrowth movement, exactly. which I think is connected to. Malthusian environmentalism and um, that's a whole other topic but I do think that it's related to the carbon offset emissions and all of these kind of different programs whether it's through the aviation field um, using Corsia or in the broader context I believe that um, there's there's this guilt that comes along with Western countries in many many different ways um, where they're thinking, okay, we need to, we are like a virus on this planet, and we need to reduce ourselves in a certain way. 
and other developing countries are not playing that game either. So I, I right, like if you look at pollution, let's say in China or in India, if we're going to go into that kind of tangent, um, their emissions are much higher, as you're saying, and they're increasing more rapidly. I, I guess that there's also less regulations there, right? So mm -hmm. they're kind of freer to, to pollute, if you would like, or um, one could argue that carbon emissions are not pollution at all, but in fact rather a natural phenomenon. Um, <laughs> That that is a whole other topic. So, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna check over here because I feel like we could go very far down different tangents. So I want to kind of bring us back into 